stand and we'll have our <coughs> Bible reading. <coughs> I think I had uh, Jamie do this in the NIV translation, and my sermon is from the King James, which she knows, but I forgot to uh, make it the same, so it'll, it'll be just a little worded just a little bit differently. Uh, so we're going to look at the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, starting with verse number 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for all who are in attendance here this morning. We appreciate so much being in your house with your people and being inspired uh, by our fellowship with one another. I pray, dear God, that the proceedings will be acceptable to you today, that you will receive our worship and that you will be glorified through it. Thank you so much for all the wonderful benefits that we receive on a daily basis. We pray for all of these on our prayer list that they may receive healing and also comfort and release from the grief that they may be bearing. Thank you for the Lord who is our great redeemer and great physician. In his name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Our opening hymn is Blessed Assurance, 477, and we'll do all three stanzas. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his Bring from above 
is our uh, communion song and we're going to be singing the breaking of bread verses 1 and 2 uh, if you're here this morning and did not receive your communion packet and wish to partake with us um, someone, will be, someone will deliver that to your seat at this time if you'll simply raise your hand we'll bring your communion packet to you All right, we'll be using verses 1 and 2 of the breaking of bread. <clears throat> come to the feast John 1156 what think ye is what they're asking that he will not come to the feast after the resurrection of Lazarus the chief priest decided to kill Jesus Jesus withdrew into the country to await a moment when it could be said his hour had come When the time for the, for the uh, final Passover had come, many of the Jews went to Jerusalem to purify themselves. As they waited for the big day, they began to look for Jesus. It was then that they asked the question, What think ye? That he will not come to the feast? there was nothing more certain than the fact that he would come because it was the last Passover he had been present at the institution of the first Passover in the book of Exodus you remember the blood on the doorways 
or lentils, as they called it. He was there. You know he was there because he said he was older than Abraham. <laughs> so before Abraham, I am. So he was there at the first Passover. It was there that the Israelites were told to stay, to slay a lamb for each family and strike the blood on the side post and the upper door post of each home. God said, I will pass over the land and slay the firstborn of every family in Egypt. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, the time has come when the last Passover will take place. That is why that Passover is called the Last Supper. So the question was asked, what think ye? What think ye? That he will come to the feast? There was no way Jesus would miss that feast. That was his purpose for coming. He was not going to miss that feast. He himself was to be the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. And after he observed that feast in preparation for the slaying of the lamb of God, it was at this time that he instituted the Lord's Supper. He has commanded the Christian to observe this memorial feast Remembering that when the Lord returns in judgment, he will see the blood on the door of the church of Christ. I'm not knocking anybody, but he died for the church. It's his church. It's the church of Christ. I'm not up here to, uh, to talk about anybody. I'm just telling you what it says. And he will pass over us. So it is still a good question. Every week as we look toward the coming of the Lord today, we cannot help but wonder about a great percentage of the membership of our congregation. What think you? Will they be here or not? It's a sad situation. Many will not come to the feast for the celebration of the slaying of the Lamb of God who died to save us. And there is no way the Lord Jesus Christ would let any thing keep him from the attendance at that feast he's here this morning right here whether you believe in the communion service or not it has been partaken of for over 2,000 years and not missed a, not missed a Lord's Day over 2,000 years so I can't argue with that I can't argue with that fact. Somewhere in the world it has been taken on the Lord's Day for over 2,000 years. And we can't, it'll be continued until he comes back, too, some way or another. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come for the table now is spread. You famishing, you weary come, and thou shalt be richly fed. You can't be richly fed if you're not here. And I'm calling on the ones <laughs> that can't hear me <laughs> to come back and meet around the Lord's table as it's commanded for us to do on the first day of the week. We can't partake of anything else if we don't partake of the, of the Lord's Supper. You know, they asked, where's Thomas <laughs> in, verse, in uh, chapter 20 of Acts verse 7 he said and upon the first day of the week we were gathered together to break bread and on uh, in 1 Corinthians 11 25 we read for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes and Luke 22 18 says do this in remembrance of me in the New Testament the celebration of the Lord's Supper was not a one, uh, one Sunday out of the year occurrence or on a day called Easter, nor was there such a thing as Resurrection Sunday that occurred once a year. The celebration of the re resurrection of Jesus was an every Sunday of 
event. You know, when the Lord first appeared to his apostles, Thomas wasn't there. He doubted everything till he seen the, the hands and the feet, and he put his hands in him. But what if the Lord had decided that was it? I was going to call over. Thomas would have missed it. It's very important to be here every Sunday morning as the time has been set aside for that purpose. And we have excuses. People say, well... Old Peter was a hypocrite. He denied the Lord three times. So I ain't going down there hanging out with that bunch of people. Don't think it like that. Think of what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Everything else is secondary. He said to meet on the first day of the week, and that's what I am here for this morning. And I pray that that's what you all are here for. Thank you. If you would prepare to take the bread, I'll pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, to God, we thank you, Father, for this day that you blessed us with. And dear Lord, we're just so thankful. Father, for for you and your word. <clears throat> dear Lord, we are so thankful, Father, for everyone that is able to come out here, Father, and partake of your Lord's Supper, dear Lord. Dear Lord, as, <clears throat> as we partake, dear Lord, let us clear our minds of all earthly things, dear Lord, and concentrate on the significance of this meal. Dear Lord, as we take this bread, let us remember that your body was broken on that day. Our God and Heavenly Father, how thankful, Father, that we are to gather together here this morning and to be around the Lord's table. God, we're thankful for everyone here this morning. And God, as we prepare to partake of the cup, which represents the blood of Jesus, which was spilled upon this earth for every soul that's ever, ever lived or ever, ever will live, to take away the sins of the entire world. And God, only Jesus, the only perfect sacrifice that could ever be given, is responsible for that. And God, we remember him today as we partake of the communion. We remember his body and his blood. And Father, we know that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness or no remission of sin. And God, how thankful we are for Jesus that he willingly went to the cross and bare our sin there. And God, as we go through this week, I pray you help us to be more like our Savior, that we be more loving and more kind, more compassionate, more forgiving. And it's in his name that we pray. Now we'll have just a couple of minutes
I have seen my last tomorrow and I'm holding my last breath goodbye sweet world of sorrow cause my new life begins with death and I'm standing on the mountain and I can hear the angel song I am reaching over Jordan and take my hand Lord lead me home and all my burdens they are behind me I have prayed I have prayed my final prayer so don't you cry over my body cause that that ain't even me lying there I am standing on the mountain and I can hear the angel songs and I am reaching over Jordan and take my hand Lord lead me home and I am standing on the mountain and I can hear the angel songs for I am reaching over Jordan and take my hand Lord lead me home and take my hand, Lord, lead me graduation time and uh, we have students that are graduating from college and high school and eighth grade we have compiled some of the names but we may not have all of them uh, if uh, you have a student that's in one of those uh, graduation classes let uh, uh, Jason know uh, because we will be, he'll be purchasing Bibles uh, for eighth graders, high school graduates, and also college graduates. And we'll present those probably next month. So just wanted to let you know because we don't want to miss anybody uh, on that. Uh, last week we began a series, series of messages on the uh, First Peter, and this morning I'd like to uh, focus on one particular word that is found quite often in both First and Second Peter, and that's the word precious. We use that word uh, quite a bit, uh, and because the meaning of that word is of great value, or something that we hold in high esteem. And we see the children, the young children among us, and we call them precious. And we refer, refer to our grandparents and parents as precious father, precious mother. And so it is we're going to see that there are things in the writings of the Apostle Peter 
that are considered very precious. One of the things we noted uh, last week in chapter 1 was something that we don't normally associate with the word precious. We just don't do it. It's sort of like the word death there in the book of Revelation when John says, blessed are those who die in the Lord. And the word means happy. We don't associate happiness with death, but we know that from the Lord's perspective, there's happiness. So it's interesting here in this first point I want to make that precious is the trial of our faith. We don't hardly ever think of that. When we're going through temptations and trials, temptations of that from the inside, trials or pressures from the outside, we don't think of those as things that are precious, but the Bible tells us why they are. In verse 7 of chapter 1 of 1 Peter, the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold. And we know that gold is considered precious, it's considered valuable, but people are more valuable. It's more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory of the appearing of Jesus Christ. The point is, when we go through these trials and temptations, that to us are something very frustrating and many times very painful, that the end result of that is our growing in the faith and being prepared for the second coming of Christ. Now, another thing that we know is precious, and that is the blood of Christ. First Peter mentions that in chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. We just partook of the blood of Christ in our communion service through our emblems. Now let's notice what it said here about Jesus himself. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver or gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You will remember that Judas, when he went back to the authorities and threw the money back at him for betraying the Lord, he said, I have sinned in that I betrayed innocent blood. There's something very unnerving and very frustrating and very complex and confusing and even makes us very angry when innocent blood is shed. We have tragically had to hear of many schools, especially elementary schools, some high schools, in which shooters have gone in and shot little children. That's innocent blood. That's why to us, we cringe more, we get madder, we get more upset, because it's one thing when somebody deserves to die on death row for hurting others, but it's another thing when there's innocent blood. And that's what Christ had, precious blood without blemish, without spot. The first time that I saw innocent blood, I was with my father on the farm of some friends of ours who got murdered by a man who thought he killed his wife In Akron, Ohio, he came down to Clinton, Ohio. His car ran out of gas. He went to the farm where this old couple lived, and uh, he asked for their car. The man resisted, so he murdered both of them. 
Now, I was about, I was a teenager when this happened. And, uh, of course, I was at the house after it happened. We went by, and we're getting some things around the farm. And I never thought a whole lot about it, except I had this eerie feeling uh, all the time I was there. And then I saw one of my uncle's detective magazines. And uh, when I was at his house, and I started leafing through it, and there it was, the farmhouse where those people died. And in those detective magazines, they show more than what newspapers show. They actually show what the police compiled. And there in that kitchen, all over those walls, was splattered innocent blood. And so... It makes us cringe. It makes us hurt. It makes us angry when innocent blood is shed. But when Christ's innocent blood without blemish was shed, he was paying a price for our sins. And that's what makes it so much better. That's what makes it a good thing. Not the death, the unjust death but that he died for others. Dying for others is not an unusual thing. Mothers and fathers many times have put their bodies over their children to save their lives. Teachers have put their bodies over to school children to save their lives, and they themselves get killed. Soldiers are constantly going to war and giving their lives for others. Policemen are laying down their lives for others. Firemen are laying down their lives for others. It happens all the time. Jesus had the ability, because of his complete innocence, to die for our sins. Kind of reminds us of the cross itself. The cross has become a beautiful emblem. The original cross, of course, was not a beautiful emblem. The Romans would not wear a cross around their neck, whether it was gold or made of wood or any other thing, because it was just like wearing a gas chamber or a hangman's noose around your neck. It was a horrible way to die. It was the worst way to die. Well, what made the difference? Why do we now put crosses in the church buildings? Why do people now wear crosses around their necks? Because of what? Jesus did. Jesus made the cross something beyond what it originally was. A beautiful emblem of sacrificial love for us. So that we could all share the most beautiful verse in the Bible of John 3 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The next verse is a beautiful one, too. Not quoted as much. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The blood of Christ is precious. Let's keep it precious. Let's not go back on him. Let's stay faithful to him, as was brought out in our communion devotion this morning because when we don't we're regarding the blood of Christ as just anything or nothing now let's notice something else since we're talking about Christ in 1st Peter chapter 2 he is called precious Lord let's read about that 1st Peter 2 starting with verse 1 Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. That's what you all are doing here today. You're desiring God's word. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Jesus should always be precious to us. 
Something that is precious, we protect. We should protect our time with our precious Lord. He likes to hear from us. He wants to hear our prayers. He likes us to defend him in a world that hates him. Let's allow precious time to be spent for a precious Lord. Let's give of ourselves, our gifts, our talents, our money, everything to him because he is the one who is precious. We also read something else in Peter in the second book, chapter 1 and verse 1, that we have a precious faith. Not just any faith, but a precious faith. One of great value. One that should be held in high esteem. Let's notice verse 1 of 2 Peter 1. Simon Peter, a servant and a, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We obtained this faith. It's such a blessing. Let's always preserve it. Let's always respect it and be thankful for it. As I close, I want us to look at 2 Peter 1, just dropping down to verse 4. Peter says that we not only have precious faith and a precious Lord, but we have precious promises. We have promises that have been made to us that are of great value. And we don't want to forget those promises. Notice, if you will, 2 Peter 1 and verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great. I mean, that's a lot. One, it's one thing being great, and it's another thing being exceeding great. We have exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. One of these divine promises, one of these great and precious, exceeding great and precious promises was mentioned right here in this text, that we can partake of the divine nature. Now, you and I know that being born as humans, we don't, norm we don't have a natural divine nature. Uh, by that, I mean we're not perfect. But somehow, some way, we're going to receive a divine nature. Well, we were baptized into Christ. The scriptures tell us that we receive the forgiveness of our sins and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, he's a divine being, equally powerful to the Father and the Son. That gave us a divine nature. But we still have two natures within us until we die. We have human nature, and we have divine nature. Now, the goal is, is to perpetuate the divine nature, to do all that we can to allow the Holy Spirit to give us a divine nature. Now all of us came into this world crying and, and it took a lot of us a long time maybe to get over it because we whine and complain and, and all of this type of stuff. Uh, that's human nature. It, it's human nature to protect ourselves. It's human nature to lash out at our enemies and we all do this. We, there's a lot of things about our human nature that we don't like. Uh, maybe we uh, take others for granted or we hurt other people with our words or our actions. But we still have to remember that we've been given a divine nature. And uh, that can be cultivated. It can get better and better every day. Now, there is a human love. We love those who love us. At least we should. It's called natural affection in the scriptures. 
We love our parents. We love our mates. We love our children, our grandchildren, our friends. And that's human love, and that's good. Yet there's also another kind of love, a God love. In the Greek, it's called agape love. And what it means is this. You love the unlovable. You love your enemies. That's a step higher. That's a divine nature kind of love. It's forgiving. It overlooks. It looks for the best in other people. We, we need our divine nature to be polished. It needs to be greater than our human nature. And I hope that we'll recognize that we have been given this divine nature and that we will try to make it better and better. And the way it can be done is by knowing the word better and better, knowing the Lord better and better through prayer and, and service to other people. It cultivates that divine nature. And that's what we want. But there's other precious promises that uh, we love. Uh, Matthew, uh, in the closing of his book, uh, talks about the words of Jesus when, just before he went up into heaven. And uh, we see from verse 17 that the apostles were standing around him, watching him go up to heaven in a cloud. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. And their human nature also showed through some of them, and some doubted. Even as Jesus was taken up into the heavens, some doubted. So they were with him for three years. So if you have doubts in your life, uh, don't sweat it that much. Uh, there's nothing wrong with honest doubt. But that's what leads to better things. Uh, I don't care if it's talking about inventions or what. If some people come along saying, well, uh, you know, we can make a better car than Ford did. Uh, or we can make a better telephone than Bell did or improve on it. Or, or the uh, people that make our medicine, uh, the pharmaceutical companies, but we can make a, a better pill. And so honest doubt is good, even if it comes to spiritual things. So don't uh, jump on yourself or kick yourself or beat yourself to death because sometimes in your life, the tragedies of life and the disappointments of life cause you honest doubt. But then notice the words of Jesus in verse 18. He came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever have commanded you in this promise. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. This knowledge that Jesus is always with us, should be a great source of comfort and strength to us. So we also have precious promises about what's going to happen when we leave here. We're all going to leave here unless Jesus comes back while we're living and he'll take us personally to heaven. But if he doesn't, we're all going to die and leave here. And so he gives this precious promise in John 14. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So these are precious promises that will come to pass. In our lives, people have promised us many things. Some parents have promised their children security, and then they abandoned them. So
so they didn't have this precious promise. Some people had been promised jobs, and at the last minute, they didn't get the job. There's always disappointments in this life because many of the promises that were made won't come to pass. And I have made promises to people that I didn't keep. And you may have too. That's just the way it is here on this earth. Now we may not intend to break the promise. and We may intend to uh, give a large amount of money to a particular thing or a particular person and then time comes around there's just nothing there. We're, we're out of a job, there's nothing left. We made a promise, we can't keep it. Sometimes people can't help not keeping a promise. Other people just don't care. But the promises of God are precious and that you can count on them. They're going to be there for us no matter what. No matter if anybody else breaks their promises, Jesus won't. So I pray you'll accept these promises of the divine nature, of the salvation that is provided, and also of the promise of going to be with our Heavenly Father and all the saints who went before us. If you're here this morning and have not yet received that precious promise of faith and accepted the Lord as your Savior, I pray that you will, on the basis of your faith, even though it is small, Jesus said, if it's as big as a mustard seed, it's enough, that uh, we can come to him. So, if you have faith, in the Lord, and you believe he is the Son of God, you believe he has the ability to do all of these things for you, I pray that you will, upon that faith, uh, repent. Uh, it's talked about here in Peter, and I read it briefly to you. Uh, upon that faith, uh, confess the Lord's name before witnesses in a simple statement of faith. And if you have that faith, it will lead you to the waters of baptism in which you'll come in contact with the blood of Christ. I say that because he, his blood was shed in his death and we are buried with him in his death. So even as we come together this morning, there may be somebody who's not yet a Christian and they love Jesus, and they want to do something uh, for him. Your obedience to him is the greatest gift you can give to him. So this morning, if you wish to step out in faith and confess the Lord as your Savior and be baptized, uh, we can help you with that. So stand now, and if you have a need, come to the front rows, and I'll find out what that need is, and we'll help if we can. We'll sing a very familiar hymn, Just As I Am, uh, verses 1 and 3 to start this morning. Just as I am.